Hello, everybody. My name is Dr. Kat Fleece from Central New Mexico Community College. In this presentation, we will focus on the peripheral nervous system, or the PNS. Not that we haven't said a few words already about the cranial and spinal nerves, but we're going to go into a bit more depth and add to that the various receptors in the body and give some examples of how reflexes work. The peripheral nervous system includes everything in the nervous system that is at the periphery, you could say, of the central nervous system. So all the, the neural structures that are not part of the brain or the spinal cord belong to the peripheral nervous system, which includes your cranial and spinal nerves, but also the ganglia, particularly your sensory ganglia that you have already learned about, which are located in the dorsal root ganglia outside the spinal cord. We also have some outside of the brain. There are additional ganglia that we haven't learned about, and I mistakenly also indented the autonomic nuclei, but they really should be at the same level as the sensory ganglia. Your autonomic nervous system has its own ganglia. So both the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system has collections of cell bodies called the autonomic ganglia outside of the central nervous system. When we get to the autonomic nervous system, we will discuss all this. Sensory receptors are going to be discussed in this presentation as well. The motor endings you've already studied when you studied the axonal terminals of somatic motor neurons in the neuromuscular junction, and you've already learned a little bit about the varicosities of the autonomic motor neurons that innervate smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, as well as glands. So overall, the function of the peripheral nervous system is for communication between the body and the central nervous system. One more time, you've seen this slide before, be sure that you understand that bundles of axons outside of the central nervous system are referred to as nerves. Now you're going to see that nerves actually have in and around them connective tissue layers as well, very similar to what we saw in a skeletal muscle organ. So here we're looking at a nerve, and a nerve is wrapped up in a connective tissue that gets a very similar name as the connective tissue that we saw wrapping up a skeletal muscle. In the case of the skeletal muscle, we called it the epimesium. In this case, we call it the epineurium. The bundles of axons we refer to as fascicles, just like we called a bundle of muscle cells a fascicle. And a fascicle is going to be wrapped up by a connective tissue layer, which we call the perineurium. And then finally, individual axons are going to be covered with a delicate connective tissue called the endoneurium. So these terms, um, epineurium, perineurium, endoneurium, along with fascicle, should sound very familiar to you. Clearly now you can see that a nerve is an organ. It also has blood vessels, for instance. And therefore, we need to be very careful when we use our terminology and not refer to a neuron as a nerve. A nerve is a multicellular organ made up of different structures, not just nervous tissue, but also blood vessels and connective tissues. Um, a neuron can be called a nerve cell, but we should not refer to a neuron or nerve cell as a nerve. As you know by now, there are two ways to classify nerves. We can classify them based on what kinds of neurons are present, and therefore we have three categories or three classes. Nerves that only contain sensory neurons, such as your dorsal root nerves, are sensory nerves. Your ventral roots are examples of motor nerves because they only contain motor neurons. And then all of your 31 pairs of spinal nerves are mixed nerves. We can also classify the nerves based on where they arise from. 
And so we have some nerves that arise from the brain. We call them the cranial nerves. And then there are the spinal nerves. The cranial nerves, some of them are purely sensory. The majority of them are primarily motor nerves. And some of them are really truly mixed nerves. Now, you will see that for the most parts, part most anatomists agree on there being 12 pairs of nerves. On a slide here or there, I may put 13 because there is actually uh, an additional nerve that is still not well understood and sometimes it's called cranial nerve zero um, and you'll see it being mentioned on one of the next slides. So sometimes we talk about 13 pairs but on, on average we usually say 12 pairs of cranial nerves. So let's first focus on those cranial nerves. As I said, there are a total of 12 pairs, but there is an additional one that is poorly understood. And um, there's a little bit of controversy about it. We, we can refer to it as the terminal nerve or nerve zero or just TN. I'm not going to say a whole lot more about it. Uh, it'll be listed in the, the next table. Um, where we go over the major functions of the nerves, and that's about it. Now, what you do need to know about the cranial nerves is the following. You need to know their names. You also need to know what the Roman numeral is for each one of those cranial nerves, because when you start to be in your professional field, Different professionals will refer to cranial nerves by their actual names. Others will refer to them by their numbers. Uh, still others will mix the two. So you really need to be familiar with both the names and the numbering system. I also suggest that you are familiar with which cranial nerves have parasympathetic motor neurons in them. So there's four pairs of cranial nerves that have parasympathetic fibers in them. None of the cranial ner nerves carry sympathetic fibers that originate from the brain. There are some that will be present in the cranial nerve, but those fibers, those sympathetic fibers, actually arose from the spinal cord and then eventually join a cranial nerve. There are so there are I'm sorry there are several nerves that function in taste be sure you know that as well. So again, here we see an image illustrating the 12 pairs of cranial nerves that that odd number is that terminal nerve is not shown here. And there are many mnemonics that help you remember the cranial nerves, especially by, by name. The one that I really like is illustrated at the top here, where it says O, 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 to touch and feel very good velvet, ah. Now notice that I've underlined the first letter of each word, except for the ah, which in which we have both the A and the H underlined. And each underlined letter corresponds to the first letter of a cranial nerve. This is also the order of the numbering system for these cranial nerves. And it's the order more or less uh, in which they appear on the brain. Remember that the majority of the cranial nerves to be exact, 10 pairs of the cranial nerves are associated with the brain stem. So from the midbrain to the pons to the medulla oblongata. And therefore that leaves only two pairs of cranial nerves that are not associated with the brain stem, except of course for that terminal nerve. But I'm not going to mention that one any more, except for one more time in the table of functions. So the cranial nerve number one, which is your first O here, is the olfactory nerve. And remember, everything occurs in pairs in the nerve system. So we will often just talk about a cranial nerve, a spinal nerve, but never forget that they occur in pairs. This is going to be the nerve that arises from the olfactory nerve 
epithelium inside of your nose so that you can smell. This is an example of a purely sensory nerve. So this is number one, the olfactory nerve. Number two, and notice that you must use Roman capital numbering, the, the Roman capital, capital numbering system. So you cannot, you may not, this is not at all accepted for you to write this as a two like so, or even a Roman um, <clears throat> number two as such. So those are not internationally accepted nomenclatures. Op the optic nerve arises from the posterior aspect of each one of your eyeballs. It is also a purely sensory nerve that goes into the brain via the thalamus, reaches the, the visual cortex. So that's number two. And so on. So you can continue to go down the line. Here we have um, the oculomotor nerve, which is number three, the trochlear nerve, the abducens, the vestibulocochlear, um, then, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot the facial nerve and the trigeminal nerve for five and seven. Um, if we go to number nine, we go to the glossopharyngeal nerve. Um, then we get to number 10, the vagus nerve. 11 is the accessory nerve. And 12 is the hypoglossal nerve. Now, I'm going to make more sense out of all these, na these names of nerves with the table that's coming up in just a moment. But before I do that, the two pairs of nerves that are sometimes difficult to keep uh, different, uh, separated in our minds, uh, especially when you're in lab and you have to identify these on the models, are the hypoglossal, which is your last pair, and accessory nerve, which is number nine. So let's say a few words about this accessory nerve for a moment. Notice that it almost kind of looks like a ladder, very typical look. And that is because this nerve um, actually recruits some of the axons that are uh, arising from the spinal cord, which is also why we call it the accessory nerve. So this is the actual nerve, and these are all kinds of fibers coming in to form the nerve. So the accessory nerve always very much looks like a ladder. While the hypoglossal nerve, notice that it really arises very much from the anterior side of the medulla, with many of the earlier numbered nerves sort of um, surrounding the superior portion of that medulla or that little crease here in between the pons and the medulla. Your trigeminal nerves, that's another one I should comment on, literally says three twins because it actually has three branches within it um, that go to different parts of the, the face uh, and the head. And it's a very big nerve. It's kind of your landmark nerves. And when you look at all these nerves, in my opinion, especially if you look at uh, the pons along with the medulla oblongata, it looks like some big insect head. And so the eyes, the biggest part of these eyes here, to me, are the trigeminal uh, nerves. While <clears throat> your little antennae that you see here are your oculomotor nerves with the trochlears in between, maybe secondary antennae of your bug's head. So aside from knowing the names and the numbers for your cranial nerves, you're going to need some functions. And, and don't get too carried away with detailed functions. You just need to know some of the major functions. You also should have a bit of a feel for whether the nerve is a sensory nerve, a motor, motor nerve, or both, meaning a, a mixed nerve. Uh, in this table, I should have really replaced the both sensory and motor with mixed. So I hope you realize that when the term mixed here is used, we are I'm sorry, when we say both, we really mean that it's a mixed nerve. So let's get that terminal 
nerve out of the way. Supposedly, it is a purely sensory nerve, and it seems to be involved in the detection of pheromones. And the reason why we're not going to discuss a whole lot more about it is because this is a nerve that we definitely see in other animals and even in humans, but it's not 100% sure how much uh, we depend on this nerve for pheromones. There's some controversy there. So let's just focus on the, the remaining 12 pairs. I already mentioned that the olfactory nerve, number one, is purely sensory involved in olfaction or smell. Um, the optic nerve also purely sensory arises from the back of your eyeballs and then makes it to the visual primary visual cortex so that you can see. Now, arising from the eyeball, or I should say going more going towards the eyeball than arising from the eyeball uh, are are several more uh, nerves and they're all going to innervate slightly different skeletal muscles that make your eyeballs move so there are three more nerves that we see um, associated with your eyeballs and the next one is is one of those nerves it is called the oculomotor nerve and if you listen to that name it literally says that it moves the eyeball it mainly has motor fibers so we'll just classify it as a motor nerve um, and like i said it it innervates what we call those extrinsic eye muscles which are the skeletal muscles on the outside of the eyeball that yank and pull on the eyeball. Not too worried for a lecture for you to know specifically which muscles, but the majority of those muscles, not all of them. Now, this is your first nerve that you need to know about that also has parasympathetic fibers. And those parasympathetic fibers are going to go to some of the smooth muscles inside of your eyeball so that your pupils can change size as well as the shape of your lens can change so that you can change your vision from far away to close up. The next uh, nerve is the trochlear nerve and it also innervates the um, eyeballs muscles but only one set. So the superior oblique eye muscles are innervated by the trochlear muscle and this is really a very much a motor nerve. Then we go to the trigeminal nerve, which doesn't innervate the eyeball. We're going to see that um, there is one more muscle, uh, one more nerve that innervates extrinsic muscles in the eyeball, but it's not this one, the trigeminal. The trigeminal is very much a mixed nerve, and it therefore receives stimuli from the face, but it also sends motor um, it also sends um, action potentials, I should say, to the skeletal muscles involved in mastication. Mastication refers to chewing. Um, for instance, the, the temporalis and the masseter are good examples of muscles that are involved in chewing. As we continue down the list, we get to the cranial nerve number six called the abducens and if you listen to the word it says abduct and this is a muscle i'm sorry this is a nerve that innervates a muscle that abducts your eyes and you know what abduction means it means to move something away from its center point so this is a nerve that stimulates those extrinsic skeletal muscles in your around your eyeball that makes your eye move sideways or it abducts the eyeball. That is the last uh, nerve that innervates the eyes. We have a nerve called the facial nerve, very much a mixed nerve once again, just like the trigeminal. And so it's going to receive sensory information from the face, but we're focusing here especially on the fact that the facial nerve is going to supply um, axonal fibers, axonal terminals, I should say, to the skeletal muscles that allow you to have facial expressions. In addition, this is your second nerve with parasympathetic fibers. And what we see is that these parasympathetic fibers um, are going to stimulate your salivary glands, 
but not all of them. There's one salivary gland called the parotid, not to be confused with the parathyroid glands. This is a totally different gland. This is a, a gland that secretes saliva. We have several. This is one of them. So the parotid is not innervated by the facial uh, nerve. In addition to the salivary glands, your lacrimal glands, which are your tear glands, which sit just slightly above your eyeball, um, are called lacrimal glands, are innervated by the facial nerve. And then finally, another important thing for you to remember that is that this is one of the nerves that is involved in taste. So it brings in the sense of taste. But there are several nerves that are involved in taste. So not just one nerve like we've seen so far for um, smelling and seeing. Now we get to the nerve that arises from your inner ear where both your hearing or auditory receptors are located and your equilibrium or vestibular receptors. So this nerve is really primarily a sensory nerve. Supposedly there are some motor fibers in here as well, but a minimal amount. So this is a nerve that informs you about what sounds you're hearing and um, what how your body is moving and how your head is turning, namely your uh, equilibrium receptors sent action potentials into your brain. This is the last part of the table that goes over the cranial nerves. The glossopharyngeal or glossopharyngeal is yet another mixed nerve. And if you listen to what it literally says, or if you want to literally translate it, what it says is tongue. Glosso always refers to tongue. And then pharyngeal or pharyngeal refers to the pharynx. Notice the spelling of pharynx, you guys. You'll talk much more about the pharynx in the respiratory system in AMP2, but notice that the N belongs in front of that X. The pharynx is really just the throat, the back of your throat, um, just to clarify that a little bit. So this is a muscle that clearly is going to impact some things that are related to your tongue. And what we see is that it actually is involved in taste again. So this is your second nerve involved in taste. After all, um, it innervates the tongue. So taste receptors in the tongues can help send signals, even somewhat um, sensation from your palatine tonsils. This is your third nerve with parasympathetic fibers. And the, the role of these motor fibers is this time to innervate that last or that, that other salivary gland called the parotid gland, which is not innervated by the previous nerve that we looked at a moment ago. This is one of two nerves that is involved in the gag reflex. The vagus nerve is as well. So number 10 is the vagus nerve. This is definitely a nerve you must know, you must know, you must know, you must know. It is a very important nerve in the body. It is a nerve that you will talk over and over and over about in AMP2, as well as in pathophysiology, possibly in pharmacology, etc. The reason for this is that despite the fact that this is a cranial nerve, this nerve descends all the way into your abdominal cavity. It controls your heart and it controls most of your abdominal viscera, particularly uh, digestion and many other structures. It is very much a mixed nerve. It also is involved in taste as well as the gag reflex. And it is a muscle, not a muscle, <laughs> a nerve that has parasympathetic fibers. And I believe that's our fourth one now that has parasympathetic fibers. So this is our last one. And again, these are going to innervate uh, many of your viscera in your abdominal area, even your thoracic area, because that includes the heart and the lungs. And then it also innervates some of the muscles that sit higher up, such in the larynx area and the pharynx area.
Finally, we get to our accessory nerve. As I mentioned earlier, um, that's a nerve that also recruits or accesses some of the axons that uh, actually begin in the spinal cord area. It is mainly a motor nerve that is going to stimulate your sternocleidomastoid and trapezius muscles to contract. The last nerve, nerve 12, hypoglossal, since you know, know you now know what glossal means, it means tongue, hypo below the tongue. This is a nerve that is primarily a motor nerve that is going to stimulate your tongue muscles to move. I accidentally have muscles twice there. And we're going to see that it plays a role in um, making sure that you can start swallowing. It's even involved in speech because it moves your muscles of the tongue. You will learn more about the, the function of the hypoglossal nerve and the swallowing reflex in AMP2. So those are your 12 pairs of cranial nerves. Just to reiterate, you need to know their names, you need to know their numbers, you need to know what um, whether they're sensory, motor, or mixed, you need to know their major functions, you should be able to list those nerves that have parasympathetic fibers, you should also be able to list which nerves are involved in taste and the couple that are involved in the gag reflex. That brings us to the spinal nerves. And I've mentioned plenty of times that there are a total of 31 pairs. So here we see the breakdown. So we have eight pairs of cervical nerves, 12 pairs of thoracic, five pairs of lumbar, five pairs of sacral, and one pair of coccygeal nerves, meaning or referring to the coccyx. So a couple of things to, to point out that are very interesting with these nerves. For one, the names of all of these nerves and even their numbers very much correspond to the vertebrae, right? You have seven, but not eight. You have seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, etc., etc. So these numbers very much correspond to the numbers of vertebrae, except for the number eight. And this has to do with how the cervical nerves arise from in between the, um, the vertebrae. So let me make a quick little sketch here. Let's say that this is the occipital bone of your skull, O for occipital bone. And let's say that this right here is your first cervical vertebra, this is your second cervical vertebra, this is your third cervical vertebra, etc. until you have your seventh cervical vertebra. So let me put some numbers in here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then we switch over, I'll just use a different color, to the thoracic vertebrae, all right, etc. One, two. What we find, and I'll just use a different color, how about I use uh, orange to indicate the nerves, is that the cervical nerves are going to start out by arising from above, from above the vertebra that has its corresponding number. So this would be cervical number one, this would be cervical number two, cervical nerve number two, cervical nerve number three, etc. And so here we have cervical nerve number seven. So I'll say cervical nerve seven. Your cervical nerve eight then starts to arise, or I should say, from this point forward, the nerves start to arise from the inferior to the vertebra, with the switchover being cervical nerve eight. So right here, this is cervical nerve eight. And then we start with our thoracic nerves. So notice that your thoracic nerves and the ones following are going to arise from inferior to the corresponding vertebra name. So that's one piece of information. The second thing is that we shouldn't forget that the spinal cord actually stops at about L1, right? So it doesn't include, it, it stops right about here. 
So none of this is truly going to hold any spinal cord. But what is the case is that in this lower thoracic and beginning of the lumbar area, we do see plenty of nerves descending down the vertebral column to then eventually leave through the sacral foramina, for instance, right? And so they still, so there, we still refer to these, this small portion of the spinal cord as the lumbar and sacral portion because they give rise to nerves that leave the vertebral column at the sacral and lumbar um, level. We don't talk about a coccygeal spinal cord, but we do talk about a lumbar and a sacral spinal cord, despite the fact that the tip, the conus medullaris of the spinal cord, is at about L1. Now, almost all of these spinal nerves are going to become part of this big, messy network. And in anatomy, we always refer to a, a network of vessels, whether they are blood vessels or nerve vessels, we call them a plexus. So we have four major plexuses, or is it plexi? I've seen both. The cervical plexus, brachial plexus, lumbar plexus, and sacral plexus. Notice that we miss something here. No mention of a thoracic plexus. And that is because there isn't one. So what we find is that the spinal nerves that arise from the thoracic area of the spinal cord, they are going to give rise to nerves that will run in between your vertebra. I'm sorry, that will run in between your ribs. Sorry about that. I'm trying to draw and talk at the same time. And so those are called the intercostal nerves. So the majority of the thoracic spinal nerves will ultimately give rise to the intercostal nerves. On the other hand, the, the ventral rami of your spinal nerves that are not thoracic are going to participate in forming a plexus. And I've given you some examples of nerves that arise from each one of these plexuses. I know you've heard of the sciatic nerve, and you may have heard of the phrenic nerve, which is the nerve that innervates the diaphragm. Probably something you ought to know. This is a nerve that, if damaged or the area of the spinal cord that gives rise to this nerve, if that is damaged, the diaphragm cannot be stimulated to contract anymore, and consequently, we might die. This is uh, why Christopher Reeve needed help breathing, because his spinal cord was damaged so superiorly that his phrenic nerve could not send signals anymore to his diaphragm. He was just very lucky that somebody was right there with him when he had his, uh, when he fell off his horse. Okay, so we're sl slowly but surely getting ready to learn more about sensory receptors. So I've in the in the, the the presentation about the spinal cord, I already differentiated between sensation and perception. So I'm not going to go over this slide again. Um, be sure that you just go back to the spinal cord presentation if you missed that portion. So sensory receptors are either separate cells or most often they are the beginning of sensory neurons. They're the dendritic beginnings of a sensory neuron. So remember a sensory neuron is a unipolar or more accurately a pseudo unipolar neuron that looks more or less like this, right? With its cell body sitting off on a stalk and then it has its axonal terminals here. Remember those axonal terminals, they're going to be located inside of the CNS while everything else is in the PNS. And more specifically, you know by now, if we were focusing on the spinal cord, let's say, this 
all of these sensory neurons, because of course we would see many sensory neurons arising from the same area, collecting, having their cell bodies collected in the same area. And this is of course your dorsal root ganglion with the myelination here and the direction of the action potential towards the CNS. So these here, D, are your little dendrites. Well, those dendrites are going to function as the sensory receptors in many situations. So dendrites are sometimes sensory receptors. Okay. As I said, on occasion, there are specialized cells. And I shouldn't say on occasion because our eyes have lots of sensory cells called photoreceptors that are one of these examples of sensory receptors that are separate cells. In that case, what we find is that, and I'm just going to sketch the cell, I'm just going to show this specialized sensory receptor as such, and then we have the beginnings of a sensory neuron, so these would be the dendrites um, wrapped around that cell, and then the action potential would travel in that direction towards the CNS. Now these sensory receptors, whether they are specialized cells, separate cells, or they are the dendrites of sensory neurons, they're all the site where the stimulus occurs and where sensation occurs. And what literally happens is a process called transduction. Transduction means that the stimulus is converted into an electrical signal. That electrical signal will be a graded potential, very similar to either an excitatory or an inhibitory postsynaptic potential. In other words, when, let's say, you are touched and your mechanoreceptors um, create this electrical signal, or when light hits your photoreceptors, or my, the sound of my voice hits your hearing receptors, uh, thermoreceptors, pain receptors, the list goes on. When they receive their stimulus, it means that ion channels will open. And depending on which ion channels open, we're going to see either depolarization or hyperpolarization occur. The depolarizations obviously are going to lead to action potentials that travel up the sensory neurons into the central nervous system. There are many different ways in which we can classify the sensory receptors. We can classify them based on their complexity. So we can have simple or special or even complex, uh, also called complex sensory receptors. We're not going to say a whole lot anymore about our special or complex sensory receptors um, because we just don't have that kind of time this semester. We would have to go into the chapter on the special senses. But just briefly, these are the sensory receptors that we find in our special sensory organs. And the special sensory organs include your eyes, your ears, your mouth with the tongue, with the tongue, yes, and um, your nose. And together, they allow for five different special senses. Your eyes, of course, allow for you to see, so sight. But your ears have two functions. They have two special senses associated with them. Hearing is the obvious one. But also equilibrium which is something we don't often think about. The mouth for taste, which is a type of a chemical reception, of course, along with the nose, which is also, um, that is smell, is also a type of chemical reception. Smell is very often called olfaction. Now notice that touch or the sensation of temperature changes, to give you an example, are not listed here. Those are not examples of special senses. 
those are not detected by your special sensory organs. All of your specially, special sensory organs are located in your head. If you think about it, they're all in your head. Your simple sensory receptors, on the other hand, are distributed all over the body. And we're going to focus on them the most. So that is one way to classify the receptors. We look at their uh, complexity, their anatomical or structural complexity. We can also see, we can also classify them based on what stimulus they respond to or even their location. So let's do all that. So we've already more or less discussed on the previous slide the complex or simple uh, sensory receptors. Notice that they get uh, interesting names, photoreceptors, auditory and vestibular receptors in the ear, gustatory for taste receptors, and olfactory receptors in the nose for a total of five special senses. So we're done with that discussion. Let's focus on those simple receptors, which are all of these receptors that, are re that deal with somatosensation anywhere from touch, vibration, pressure, itching, pain, temperature, stretch, and proprioception. Proprioception is a form of sensation that informs us about how much our muscles are being stretched or not. Maybe they're too flaccid, maybe they're too stretched, um, our joint movements, and maybe what is happening to our bones, which can be picked up by sensory receptors in the periosteum, for instance. A lot of that information, proprioception, can make, can make it to the brain, for instance, so it's such that our brain, for instance, the cerebellum, can make adjustments in our muscle tone. Now, within the simple receptors, we have two groups, and that is they can be unencapsulated or encapsulated. When they're unencapsulated, we're literally just looking at the, the dendritic, um, the little dendrites that form the beginnings of a sensory neuron. There's nothing covering them. You're already familiar, for instance, with the root hair plexus. And uh, for some reason, we put the Merkel discs in that group as well. But you can definitely visualize a root hair plexus if I draw a little hair follicle like so, for instance, then around the bulb here would be the beginnings of your sensory neuron, which would then go into the central nervous system. All right. So this would be the root hair plexus that wraps around a hair follicle. And that would be an example of an unencapsulated, um, simple receptor. Now, what's interesting is, and this can get confusing, is that we refer to sensory receptors that are unencapsulated as free dendritic nerve endings. Now, that is kind of an oxymoron, right? Because you know very well that dendrites form the beginning of a sensory neuron and not the, the end. But when you go and get a massage, you're told that you're getting your nerve endings stimulated, while really these are not nerve endings. As a matter of fact, they are sensory nerve cell beginnings, just to make you alert of that. Now, there are some sensory receptors that are referred to as encapsulated, and that is because their dendrites or a main dendrite is wrapped up in some kind of a capsule. And these are some examples here. You've already learned about the Bacinian and Meissner's corpuscles that are present in the dermis. So yes, you're recalling information from way at the beginning of the semester. But we're going to add some, and that is inside of your skeletal muscles, you have encapsulated simple receptors we call muscle spindles. They are the ones that pick up the stimulus of a muscle being stretched or not stretched enough. This is the beginning of a sensory neuron that sends signals into the brain, may even make it to the cerebellum so that adjustments can be made 
to this, the, the tone of your muscles. Remember, your skeletal muscles all express muscle tone. And similar principle for the, the joints, they also have sensory receptors located inside of them that are encapsulated, and we call them Golgi tendon organs. Crazy name for a sensory receptor. I have neglected to add some photos or images of a muscle spindle or a Golgi tendon organ. I highly encourage you to look those up so you have a good visual and can remember them better. And so here we see a diagram illustrating the free nerve endings here, better called your dendritic beginnings of your sensory neurons. So the direction of your action potential is of course that way. This would be where you do the sensation. This is where you would do, for instance, the feeling. This is where the, the hair follicle would pick up the stimulus that some bug is crawling on your arm and the hair follicle is being moved. This is where the CNS is. This is the cell body that would be in the dorsal root ganglion if this was a sensory neuron entering into the spinal cord. Here we see that the dendrite is encapsulated we still see that the action potential travels in that direction. So that's an example of a simple sensory receptor we put into the class of being encapsulated. While here we see an example of a photoreceptor in the eye and notice that it is a totally separate cell, strange looking cell, but it's a separate cell that communicates with a uh, another with with a neuron or synapses actually with a neuron in a sense this photoreceptor is like a neuron itself so we just finished discussing the classification of receptors based on their structural complexity let's now take a look at a second method of classification and that is classifying receptors based on the kinds of stimuli that they respond to. And so here you see a list of the most common ones. This is all, I would say this is a pretty uh, complete list. There's probably a couple more, but this is pretty, pretty good here. Mechanoreceptors are going to be receptors that respond to touch and vibrations, things like that. Um, your Meissner corpuscles and Merkel discs and root hair plexus and what else did we study? The, the bacinian corpuscles, those are all good examples of mechanoreceptors. Thermoreceptors, of course, changes in temperature would be the stimuli. Photoreceptors are in your eye. They just detect differences in light. Chemoreceptors detect the binding of chemicals, and therefore we're going to see chemoreceptors, uh, or I should say, the, the receptors, the special sensory receptors that you find in your mouth and your nose are considered chemoreceptors. So your olfactory as well as your gustatory, gustatory referring to taste, are examples of chemoreceptors. We have also chemoreceptors in, the digest, in other parts of the digestive tract, by the way, as you will see in AMP2. Baroreceptors, you will talk a lot about in AMP2 as well. Baro, think of the term barometer. A barometer is a device that measures differences in pressure, air pressure to be more specific. So baroreceptors, they detect changes in blood pressure and they're located in the walls of some major blood vessels. Not all of them, but in some of the major blood vessels. Nociceptors are or is a fancy term to refer to pain receptors. In some way, we, we do have separate pain receptors, but in some way, if any of these other receptors listed here are stimulated so severely um, that they begin to trigger lots of action potentials very rapidly, we would interpret that as a form of pain as well. Pain reception is a very poorly understood 
thing that happens in the body. There's a lot of research being done. But as you know, many people continue to suffer from chronic pain for their for most of their lives. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that we don't quite understand the neural pathways all that well yet. Finally, we can classify receptors based on where they're located. Receptors that are located most closely to the exterior of the body are called exterior, exterior receptors. Those located deep within the body we call interoreceptors. And then we also create the class for the proprioceptors because, like I said earlier, they're going to respond and inform your brain about how much a, a structure such as your muscles and your joints and your periosteum, for instance, is being uh, stretched. In a sense, your proprioceptors could also be put inside or it could be part of your interoreceptors. All of these proprioceptors are going to, well, I shouldn't say all, but many of them are going to be pretty deep in the body. Um, examples of extroreceptors are going to be any of the ones that are going to be located in your skin, for instance. And we also consider the ones in our special sense organs as extra receptors, so your photoreceptor, vestibular receptors, etc., etc. When you get to AMP2, interoreceptors will be your main focus because you're going to look at all the, the digestive and the respiratory and cardiovascular um, viscera, reproductive viscera, uh, viscera of the or organs of the uh, urinary system, etc., etc. And so all of them, or many of them in the walls of their organs, basically all um, viscera that are hollow have in the walls, in their walls, uh, interoreceptors that uh, transfer information about chemistry changes, stretching, even temperature changing, changes. Now, as you know very well, some receptors can adapt easily and others can't. For instance, you go to the gym to go to your yoga class and there was uh, a Zumba class beforehand with lots of sweating. The first few minutes you are present in that room, get set up with your yoga mat, you feel like the class just stinks like sweat. But after a few minutes you can't smell it anymore. And that is because those olfactory receptors adapt rather easily. On the other hand, many of our pain receptors and those proprioceptors that must convey information about how much your muscles are being stretched and all those connective tissues, ligaments, tendons, etc., joints, how much they are being moved, those do not adapt very easily. So we have two types of receptors, or that you could say that this is another way of classifying our sensory receptors. So those that respond or adapt quickly, we call the phasic receptors. And essentially what happens is that they're, they're going to stop or they're going to reduce the numbers of action potentials that they're going to send um, to, the, to the central nervous system. So the frequency with which they allow the firing of action potentials to happen diminishes. Tonic receptors, on the other hand, respond and adapt rather slowly. And this brings us to our last topic for this presentation on the peripheral nervous system. And that is the topic of reflexes. We're all born with reflexes. We all have reflexes. And reflexes are responses to stimuli, responses that are fast and automatic most of the time, and they occur to protect us. So they're involuntary motor responses that are fast and predictable to a stimulus. Now, as you know, when you go for a full-blown physical, your reflexes, such as your patellar reflex, are typically checked. And this is just a very quick way to make sure all your synaptic connections are working. It's a quick way to check the health of your nervous system. Now, you know by now that we like to classify things in anatomy and physiology, 
And so yes, reflexes can be classified as well. Many of our reflexes we are born with, so we say that they're innate, but you can actually learn reflexes. If you think about those of you who have become parents, I'm sure you have become aware of the fact that you have actually acquired new ways to very quickly respond to something your child is doing. Or for instance, when you learn to drive a car, you also acquire a whole set of new reflexes. Or you learn to do uh, to dance with a partner, whether it's swing dancing or ballroom dancing or salsa dancing. You learn to respond very quickly to a particular lead without thinking about it. Now, reflexes may have their synapses occurring inside of the brain or in the spinal cord. So we talk about cranial versus spinal reflexes. They might be reflexes that involve your skeletal muscles, in which case they are called somatic, or they might involve your smooth or cardiac muscle tissue, in which case we call them autonomic, sometimes visceral reflexes. We may see as little as one synapsis or many. And so if there's just one synapsis found in the central nervous system, we call it a monosynaptic reflex and others, otherwise we call it a polysynaptic reflex. So the number of synapses that you count is the synapses inside the central nervous system, not outside. And you'll see why this is important when we get to the autonomic nervous system. Finally, your reflexes can stay on the same side of the central nervous system as they arrive, or they, I should say, they can enter and leave on the same side of the central nervous system, in which case we call them ipsilateral or if they cross over to the other hemisphere of either the spinal cord or the brain, we call them contralateral. We're going to focus now on the components of what is called a reflex arc. And we're looking at a reflex arc of a spinal reflex. That's what we will focus on. They're a little easier to understand than the cranial reflexes. So in the blue here, we see a sensory neuron carrying the action potentials into the spinal cord. Then the sensory neuron might directly synapse with the red motor neuron or not. There might be right here an interneuron. It depends on the reflex or interneurons. So I'm going to say question mark, question mark. Or, as I said, there might be a direct synapsis between the sensory neuron and the motor neuron. Here's the cell body of the motor neuron, and since it's going to a skeletal muscle, we know that this is a somatic motor neuron that's arising from the, the ventral horn of the gray matter. So it kind of looks like an arc that we're forming. We call this a reflex, reflex arc, and it has five distinct components. We have of course, some kind of a receptor involved. We have the sensory neurons that carry the electrical signal, signal into the CNS. We have CNS integration, which is a fancy way of saying that we see the sensory neuron synapsing, either with interneurons or directly with the motor neurons that will come out of the spinal cord. So our next component of our reflex arc is the motor neurons. And then these motor neurons are going to go to their effectors. And in this case, our effector is our skeletal muscle. Again, if we see a skeletal muscle as the effector, then by default, this must be a somatic motor neuron. You're soon going to see that there's another way to determine that this must be a somatic motor neuron. Now, please, on this diagram, don't be confused by this right here. This is really not a separate somatic motor neuron. This is all one and the same somatic motor neuron. Um, it is implying that we're innervating the skeletal muscles of the forearm and the hand and the fingers, I think. Uh, so don't get confused. There is only one long somatic motor neuron.
going to the skeletal muscle or muscles. Okay, now we can classify this particular reflex based on the previous slide in which I showed you how reflexes are classified. Clearly, it is a spinal reflex. The information enters the right-hand side of the, the spinal cord, and notice that it leaves the same side. So by that, it is a, or based on that, it's an ipsilateral reflex. It's staying on the same side. It's a somatic reflex because we are dealing with a somatic motor neuron. And determining whether it is monosynaptic or polysynaptic is a little difficult because the diagram doesn't illustrate the presence or absence of interneurons. So we can't classify it that way. There is a reflex that is really well studied and understood, and it's one of your simplest reflexes. And we say that it's a simple reflex because it's monosynaptic, meaning that there's only one synapsis inside of the CNS, meaning a direct synapsis between the sensory neuron and the motor neuron. And this is the stretch reflex. Now there are different kinds, kinds of stretch reflexes. We're going to focus on the patellar reflex. That's the reflex that occurs when you sit um, on the, the bench at the doctor's office uh, with your legs dangling off the side of the bench and the doctor hits you just below the patella where your patella interconnects with your tibia via the tibial ligament, um, I'm sorry, via the patellar ligament. When the doctor hits the patellar ligament, it just for a fraction of a moment stretches because the pressure of that little hammer causes it to stretch. That in turn stretches the muscles that are on the anterior side of your thigh. You know what they are. They're called the quadriceps femoris muscles or your quads. There's four of them. They all merge together into one tendon. That tendon grabs the patella and then from the patella we see uh, the, the ligament connecting to the tibia. Well, remember that all of your skeletal muscles have receptors inside of them that inform the brain of the muscle tone in the muscle. And so this, these are called muscle spindle receptors, which are examples of encapsulated simple receptors. So these muscle spindles, when they're being stretched, are going to send that information into the central nervous system. So let's take a look at what this is all about, and then we'll also talk about what we mean by reciprocal inhibition of the hamstrings, which are the antagonistic muscles of the quadriceps femoris muscles. So this is a, a diagram that illustrates to you the spinal cord with its gray matter and its white matter. Here we have the, the thigh area with the patella right here, which is your kneecap. These are the quadriceps femoris muscles with their tendon right here that connects to the patella. And then the patella is interconnected to the tibia bone via a small ligament called the patellar ligament. This is called here the tendon I just noticed. Really, that is not very accurate. It is done at times, but by the true definition of ligament, um, this should be called a ligament, more specifically the patellar ligament. So I will just quickly abbreviate this here, like so. So when the hammer hits onto that ligament here, it's going to kind of jerk these quadriceps femoris muscles, more than likely just one of them, your little muscle spindle receptor determines or detects that stretch, goes through the process of transduction. Remember that is converting a sensation into an electrical signal. That electrical signal in the form of action potentials will travel up sensory neurons 
into the gray matter of the spinal cord. Now we're going to first follow this pathway. So follow with me. Here's your sensory neuron and it is going to send axonal terminals directly to a somatic motor neuron. So the synapses is approximately here. The green neuron is our somatic motor neuron. So this is therefore a simple reflex because it consists of just one synapsis which is located in the spinal cord right there. This is also an ipsilateral um, reflex. So this somatic motor neuron is going to release acetylcholine onto the skeletal muscle and consequently the skeletal muscle will contract and therefore your leg will extend at the knee as follows. And that is the patellar reflex. Now, what we are going to see is two other things. And that is the following. First off, we're going to see that in all of our reflexes, our body, our nervous system is set up such that the ref is set up such that the reflex will be executed very effectively. And by that I mean the following. Let me change colors here. Um, so that it stands out a little bit better. What we're going to see is that our sensory neuron, I'm tracing it one more time, also synapses with an interneuron. Actually, I will use the blue I have here going and accentuate it. This is right here, that interneuron. Before we get to a another somatic motor neuron. I'll illustrate it with a brighter green here. But notice where that somatic motor neuron is going. That somatic motor neuron is going to the hamstrings. The hamstrings are the muscles on the back of your thigh. So they sit posterior to the femur and they are called antagonists to the quadriceps femoris muscles because they do just the opposite of what the quadriceps femoris muscles do. Your quadriceps femoris muscles, what they do is they cause extension at the knee. On the other hand, your hamstrings, they cause flexion at the knee. That's why these two muscles are considered antagonists. During a reflex, we will always see that the sensory neurons of the reflex arc will also make sure that the antagonistic muscles are inhibited. So this interneuron is going to send inhibitory signals to this green somatic motor neuron, making sure it will not release acetylcholine. So this interneuron is going to release inhibitory neurotransmitters. It is also called an inhibitory interneuron. This is very important for this reflex to be very effective. We would not want to see any type of contraction occurring in those antagonistic muscles. The second important thing that this is not illustrating is the fact that some of the sensory information, or I should say the sensory information, that is the stimulus with the little hammer, will eventually make it into your brain. So I'm drawing a purple arrow upward. So this sensory neuron will also synapse with an interneuron that will travel up via tracts located in the white matter of the, the spinal cord. And I made it look like it's crossing over and it might be that it crosses over a little bit more superiorly. But ultimately this will cross over and inform the other side of the brain of what just happened to your body. So you, you, know, you know very well that when you're in the doctor's office and your patellar reflex is, is checked that you become consciously aware of what just happened to you, even if you didn't see what happened, even if you closed your eyes. So the, the pathway into the brain, of course, is going to probably have a little bit of a, 
a delay because um, of the, the distance that might need to be traveled compared to the reflex arc that goes in and out of the spinal cord. So spinal reflexes, particularly if they're monosynaptic, are very fast. The fact that we have reflexes that are integrated at the spinal cord only, meaning that we see response um, or we see sensi sensory information entering a response, leaving uh, via the spinal cord, explains why we can still have spinal reflexes despite the fact that there might be um, damage to the body uh, superior to that particular part of the spinal cord or even the brain at times. And so this wraps up our discussion of the cranial nerves, the spinal nerves, as well as the reflexes, more specifically the, the spinal reflexes. It says end of peripheral nervous system, but we haven't really touched much yet on the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system, don't forget, is also part of the peripheral nervous system. But we will do the autonomic nervous system in a whole different uh, slideshow because there's a lot to say about the autonomic nervous system.